along with that, though, we need to modernize our philosophy on the stresses, both physical, mental, and emotional, that we're putting <coughs> someone else's students, sons and daughters, under. So we've got to make sure that as we modernize some of the things, the old way of doing things, we've got to make sure we're educating ourselves on stuff that works and stuff that doesn't. We've got to discard some bad habits. You know, we always like to say, bad things aren't going to happen to us, it's going to happen to anybody else, so someone else. We all know that's not true. We paid a big price to be in the catastrophic event club. So what can we do to make sure that we're providing education and information to make sure that we're all in a safe place? Now here's the deal, okay, it's okay to be challenging. It's okay to be tough. It's okay, I'm talking about physical demands, but it's not okay to ignore science. It's not okay to do things for the sake of doing it. It's not okay to do things that are just stupid and not grounded in good practical medicine. Because God forbid we have uh, something happen, we're gonna be held to standards. I know, I spent six hours in the deposition. And one of the things they will do is throw papers in front of you that say, are you aware of this? I have to respond, yes, because I am. Well, my job is to make you aware of it, and that's why we're having these series of talks. Now, reducing sudden death, obviously, is a topic we all should have a vested interest in. And Charlie Thompson is here uh, for a number of reasons. He's a contributing author to that. So there's probably no athletic trainer or colleague of mine in the nation who's more well-versed in this than Charlie. A little bit about Charlie, if you don't know who he is. Charlie has been at Penn State, Pitt, Someplace in Texas, I have no idea. Maine, he's currently the head trainer at the University of Princeton. He's been there a long, long time. Charlie's been awarded and recognized on every level possible in our business, culminating this past summer by being elected to the NETA Hall of Fame, the highest, the highest honor anybody in my business can achieve, and well-deserved. And Charlie speaks all over the country on this. I just happened to call him about four months ago and said, are you guys playing baseball near Brown at all? And he said, yeah, the weekend of April 5th, perfect then can you get on a train and come up and at least share some of what uh, your wisdom with our folks? And he said, yeah, very graciously. A couple other things about Charlie. Number one, I've known Charlie forever. We're dear friends. Uh, and he uh, is a Rhode Islander. Uh, he was the head trainer at the University of Rhode Island at one point. So I know there's still a little bit of blue in there somewhere. <laughs> I know there is. So Charlie Thompson. Thank you, Kim. Uh, it's great to be back. Uh, this campus has changed unbelievably. I left in 91. Uh, I'm a 1980 grad, and I uh, was back here from 88 to 91, and uh, I look exactly the same, but this <laughs> university has changed tremendously. So I um, appreciate the opportunity to come up. This is something that's uh, it's near and dear to me, and uh, I get a little editorials in there. I'll, I'll spice in. I might throw in a couple of stories, but um, I do have to put in one disclaimer. Me, I have to do this. I was uh, one of several authors of a book called Preventing Sudden Death, Sport, and Physical Activity. Um, some of the scientific information that I have in here, I don't have a lot of scientific stuff in here, don't panic, I'm not gonna, um, but some of the information uh, is, is directly from that book, so I just gotta say that. Um, what's the problem? You know, again, I, I'm, I'm a little, I'm sensitive. I, I know uh, that the university here went, went through an issue a couple years ago, but um, you're not alone, unfortunately. Uh, since the year 2000, there have been well over 20 non-traumatic deaths in college, uh, college football alone, okay? And we're not gonna hear to pick on football or any other sport, but um, just college football. We just had one this winter at Cal Berkeley uh, during conditioning. Um, and most of these deaths are uh, sickle cell trait related, the majority of them, exertional heat stroke related, asthma related and uh, sudden cardiac death related. So um, they're all derived from conditioning activities. Some of them are just during the actual conditioning sessions and some of them, uh, the rest have been during conditioning, the conditioning part of, uh, of practicing. Um, we've had 23 exertional sickling deaths in the last 12 years. Um, or if you, exertional sickling uh, death, uh, um, related. Why are we allowing this to happen? Okay, number one, we're overburdening our, our athletes with non-stop stop activities. We can't wait for the season to end because now we get to start training again. There's no recovery. Um, we tend to have, and I say we, I'm including Kim, myself, you know, everybody. Um, we tend to have a casual attitude about uh, collateral damage. 
It used to be, about, I'm going way back, you know, 30 years when we only worried about spring football and the collateral damage. Oh, well, we'll get them better by the time the fall comes. There is really no recovery period. And I don't care what sport it is. Uh, I'm here with baseball. I've, been working, I've worked probably 20-something years of college baseball, and I know the athletes, they finish their season in May sometime in the college, and they go off and they play summer baseball, and then they come back and there's fall baseball, and they have maybe a month or two where they're not really playing baseball, but some part of November or December. Um, you know, there's, no, there's no recovery. So how do we expect people to, to, uh, uh, to develop and change their body types and things like that? We've created irrational intensities uh, that are not consistent with the needs of our sports. Okay? And I think that's one of the most critical things that we'll talk about today. Um, and there's a lack of science-based programs. The idea that we're going to make them tougher, there is not one shred of evidence that you could use to back that statement up. So if that's what you're using as a rationale for what you're doing with your teams, good luck trying to back that one up if something happens. No, there is no scientific data um, that, will, uh, that will back that up. This has gotten to the point where the medical community is really concerned. Jeff Anderson, some of you may know him, he's at the University of Connecticut down the road, and uh, he's been chair of the CSMAS with the, uh, for the NCAA, um, and he has stated there is serious attention needs to be paid to the manner in which, we, uh, which some of our student athletes are being asked to train. It's not a new problem. You go back, there's an article in 1975, uh, Dr. Nokel down in Texas wrote about the dog days of football, how to kill a football player. And one of his quotes was, since it's almost always preventable, and that will under, I should have underlined and, and put that in bold, since it's almost always preventable, acknowledgement of its occurrence is embarrassing and therefore underreported. That's 1975. Okay, so we don't, we, we kind of make light of it and say, well, it's just one of those things. Well, most of the time, it's not just one of those things. Um, I'm going to throw in one little editorial here before we get going into the current problem. Um, a year and a half ago, I spoke to the American Football Coaches Association. I had a small block of time, about 10 minutes right before their keynote speaker. They, they give the NATA the spot. And one of the things that I warned them about was people not involved in our sport or not involved in athletics, as I speak to this room, are going to start taking notice and they are going to want to set the tone. They're going to want to set the rules. And some of these people, it may be up campus, it may be up in Providence. You're not still Representative John, I guess I can say that. <laughs> you know, uh, it may be down in, it may be in Indianapolis, it may be in Washington, we don't know. But with, this is going to get to the point, just like with concussions now, everybody's going to get involved. And people who don't know if a football is stuffed or inflated or what's going on with a baseball, they're going to want to make decisions and tell us how we're going to run our business. So I think it's very important that we take the first step and get out in front of this and take care of it before it gets to that point. Um, since the year 2000, again, some of this is football related, uh, but it, I think it, 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 uh, it, it speaks to everybody, to all sports. Uh, conditioning and training is the only setting for non-traumatic deaths. There's been no, foot, no deaths in football from uh, from football activity. Same with baseball, basketball, etc. Okay? Um, these incidents continue to be considered isolated rather than serial and are blamed on predis <coughs> predispositions. Dr. Nokel said that in 1975 and uh, it's still true today when you read some of the, uh, the stuff that comes out on, on some of these problems. Um, there is a belief that we are mirror mirroring sport but in truth we are merely manufacturing intensity. In a football game, the work-rest ratio is one to six. So in a 60-minute football game, at, you have about six minutes of actual physical activity. Now that may change a little bit today. We have these new hurry-up offenses, but if you time the play, the total time of, of, of actual play in a football game is six minutes. Okay, now we're running these hurry-up offenses again, so that it may change. Um, but our workouts are usually one to one. <coughs> work rest. Okay. It doesn't fit any scientific approach to condition. Of the deaths that we reported in football, 11 of the 21 happened in the first two days of activity. So the question is, are we doing too much too soon? Since I work at Princeton, they, every time you speak, 
you have to quote somebody from Princeton. So um, I actually used this quote uh, at a, in another talk, and, and I was talking more about education for athletic trainers. But I think it fits this problem uh, very well. He said, more is not better, better is better. Don't confuse activity with accomplishment. So you have your athletes and they're running around and doing all this stuff and you think, wow, we're getting better today. Don't confuse that with actually, are you really getting better? You won't know that until you actually get on the field or the court. Okay, what's happening? One of the big things, and you, everybody's heard this, rhabdomyolysis. Okay, that's happening. It's happening big time. We've had a couple of, I'll say minor cases at Princeton. We've sent a couple of kids to the hospital out of the weight room. Right? We're a, a volleyball player doing, you know, 100 and something uh, leg presses. Right? Because the strength coach was going to show them what they needed to do. And the girl ended up in, 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 in the hospital. So it happens to everybody. Um, rhabdo occurs when there is significant muscle breakdown causing release of myoglobin, which is the muscle protein, uh, into the bloodstream. And some of the substances that make up the myoglobin uh, damage the kidney. And so a lot of these people end up in kidney failure. More significantly, another part of the problem is the release of potassium into the bloodstream, which now causes uh, 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 irregular heartbeats. And so some of these people then will die of a, of a cardiac issue. Okay. Um, Probably most of you have heard about this case out in, in Iowa a couple years ago. Uh, their first work, football team, first workout after they had a, a not so good season. They came back in January and the first thing they did was they had to do 100 squats with 50% maximum weight and, and they were being timed. And they had 13 guys go to the hospital with rhabdo. Okay, they all survived. Um, last year, Ohio State women's lacrosse in March, so it's their, their season has started. And apparently they, they had some issues and the coach made them do, they did maximum pull-ups, chins, dips, and push the next day had to push football blocking sleds. And they had a number of girls, six players that end up in the hospital with rhabdo. Okay, again, they all survived, fortunately. I'm not an expert in women's lacrosse at all. I know what, how it's played, but I couldn't tell you anything about it. But I know the chin-ups, and, and the pull-ups and pushing a football blocking set have nothing to do with women's lacrosse. Speaks to my thing about you know what do we, how specific are we with our exercise? The four most common causes of non-traumatic death are sudden cardiac death, exertional heat stroke, exertional sickling, and asthma. Just a brief. I'm going to kind of go through this. Some of this is. It, I'm not, not going to go through all the scientific stuff, but just throw a couple of things out there. So what do we, what's sudden cardiac death? It's sudden death of an individual within one hour after exercise due to cardiovascular disorder. Uh, Dartmouth College had two athletes die this, this year um, after workouts. One was actually at, a, uh, at an event, cross-country skiing, uh, and the other one returned to her room after a workout, and she died approximately one hour after. Okay, so she was a classic. Um, it's a leading, sudden cardiac death is a leading cause of death in young athletes. Interesting distribution, um, and if you go down to the bottom, this one really scares me. One of seven, every 7,000 basketball players, male basketball players, are under risk of sudden cardiac death. Um, the number one cause is uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. That's the athlete's heart, the enlarged heart, the really thick muscle, okay? Um, that's the number one. Back when I, Kim and I were going to school, Mark fans was a big thing. Flo Hyman, the volleyball player, some of you are old enough to remember that case. Um, fortunately, we've been able to identify some of these problems um, and uh, have, have kind of filtered them out. Prevention, this is one of maybe the one thing, one area that's really hard to prevent unless you do a lot of testing and even that is, um, it is not so good. Health history and physical exam are important. There's a big discussion that goes on about uh, EKGs, ECGs, echocardiograms, and there's a whole population of, of physicians that say we need to be doing them, and another whole group that say no, they're a waste of money. Um, we started doing them last year, and I think we found a couple of cases, but unfortunately a lot of cardiologists don't, actually, don't really know how to relate them to athletic activity, so it's, it's kind of up in the air a little bit. 
Uh, John Dresden at the University of Washington is a big, big, big proponent of them, and he does all he does all the basketball team. And I think he does them every year, but you know, so it's 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 tough. Recognition of problems, the health history, and all that stuff is very, very important. Positional heat stroke is a medical emergency involving life-threatening hyper, hyperthermia, rectal temperature over 105 degrees Fahrenheit, with concomitant uh, commitment, uh, central nervous system dysfunction. This one really concerns me because if you look at the numbers from 1975 to 1995, we had 24 exertional heat stroke deaths. Uh, from 1996 to 2009, we had 42. How is that possible? We've got Gatorade and Powerade. Um, you guys are Coke school, right? We got Powerade. Uh, we're at Coke school too. I should probably should have thrown that up first. We got all this new clothing, right? The Under Armour, the this, the that. Everybody's got Cool Max, this and that. Hot, we, we give water. When, when Kim and I were in school here, we had one water break. We put out 100 cups. Everybody came by and got a cup of water. And that was all we did. And now there's water all over the place. All of our sports, you know, they're drinking Gatorade and all this stuff. Uh, probably too much Gatorade. But um, so somewhere we're, we're really missing the boat here. We're, we're, we've got a problem with this. Exercise is the culprit, not always the condition. So you can go out there in the middle of the winter, and if you run somebody too hard, they can end up dying from exertional heat stroke. So don't forget that. We need how do you prevent it? Uh, be, be aware of extrinsic uh, uh, factors, the temperature, humidity, uniform clothing, all that stuff. Rest, fluids that we you know that that we give them now, and then there are some other intrinsic factors like intensity, dehydration issues, diuretic use. We don't, probably don't have as much of that anymore, um, and then it, uh, inadequate acclimatization. Everybody uses urine color as a as a, uh, a benchmark. Even the NCAA puts out a poster. I don't know if you have them up anywhere. You know, check the color of your urine uh, to see if you're dehydrated or not. If it's really dark or if it's really light. Well, not. Me. I know some people that that drink too much beer, and they always tell me at the end of the night when they pee, what's their color look like? What's their urine? It's clear. Okay, and actually, they're dehydrated at the time. They don't even realize it. So I stress with my athletes, don't use the color of your urine as a really good indicator. Um, we do a lot of specific gravity testing. You can do it with dipsticks. You can buy a, a meter and just put a drop on there. We'll, we'll do it uh, during the summer without, we have a lot of football players around on campus. So we'll test them during the summer, see where they're at. And then during preseason, we, we also test them. Um, in addition to preventing some of the, uh, the exertional heat stroke problems, we find that a lot of our athletes that are suffering muscle injuries um, have, uh, are very dehydrated. So they have, kind of have a, a, dual, a dual function there with that. So um, just a little thing, you know, again, that, so be careful with that chart. Have a plan. Uh, the first thing you need to do is get them in cold water. So if you're, you know, some of you sports, you don't have the athletic trainer right with you, the first thing you do is get them in the water and then call uh, 911. You need to cool them within the first 30 minutes. You may have to fight with your EMS. I don't know what kind of relationship you have with them. They might, might, might want to get them into the, uh, into the ambulance, into the hospital right away. But it's very important that we get them cooled down first. The first 30 minutes are critical to them surviving. So you have to convince your EMS system that that's, that's, that's uh, important. The sickle cell trait, uh, you know, that's a big thing. A couple years ago, the NCAA uh, suggested that uh, they wanted to make it mandatory that we had, we knew the sickle cell trait status of all of our athletes, and unbeknownst to any medical people in the Ivy League, the Ivy League office uh, put in a rider that made it, uh, made it optional. You could sign a waiver on this. Uh, I, I can tell you this, Princeton University, there's no waiver. We make them uh, present us with, with sickle cell um, trait status. Uh, it's a genetic disorder, increased exercise, Intensity causes the red blood cells to sickle when they release their oxygen. So instead of being nice and round, they look like a, a kidney bean, and they end up blocking the, uh, the, the blood vessels so there's no blood uh, traveling to, uh, um, to the brain and to the heart. Um, they usually end up with a rhabdomyolysis. That's how they end up dying. Um, this was always thought to be a case for African Americans, uh, but we have become a very homogeneous society. Okay, and, and actually, it's a malarial thing. It's not just African Americans. 
It's people from uh, countries where malaria is, is still a problem, um, but we are, again, a homogeneous society, so it takes n nothing to find out. Every child born in the United States is tested at birth for sickle cell trait. So it may be a little difficult to find out depending on uh, access to medical records. I'm assuming you get uh, the university uh, wants immunization records and things like that. You, you, you're getting medical records from them. So that's something you need to, to, to look for. The NCAA has a deal with Quest Labs. Uh, it costs you 12 bucks to get a, a sickle cell trait um, test. But we make all of our athletes and uh, a lot of schools are, are making it. Are you guys doing that? Mandatory. Mandatory, good. So that's great. You know who's got it, but who knows who has it? Is Kim or Mike or Andy, are they the only ones that know? Okay, everybody has to know. All the coaches have to know. Um, uh, let's skip some of that. It's not necessarily heat related. Okay, that's the other thing that people think, oh, it's hot, you can't run. That's not true, okay? The other thing for you coaches, it's not a reason for disqualification. You can't confuse this with sickle cell anemia, which Somebody has sickle cell anemia, they'll never get to you. They, most of them, they, they cannot participate in sports at all. But being positive for sickle cell trait is not a reason for medical disqualification, unless they have serious problems. From it. It's not a, a, a red flag for you if you're recruiting and you find out and you know they have sickle cell trait. Don't panic about it. Okay? All you need to do is watch them and monitor them a little bit. They can, do, they can lift weights, they can run, they can do all that stuff, but you just got to be careful. Okay. So if Kim is getting the information, he needs to make sure that all of you know who, who on your team has sickle cell trait, as well as the strength and conditioning coaches. I don't know what the issue here is with FERPA and HIPAA and all those things, but um, I know Princeton is a FERPA school. So we're allowed, you have a need to know, I can, I can give you that information. So I don't know how you... Yeah, we have the same thing here. FERPA, yeah. So the coaches, there's a need for the coaches to know that information. So. That should be okay. Obviously, I'd run it through some people before I just started telling everybody. So. Asthma, uh, you know, maybe, asthma. what's the problem with asthma? Well, asthma was the reason why uh, there was an athlete a few years ago at Northwestern University, a football player was training in the summer, actually had athletic training coverage during the, the event and had asthma attack. He refused to use his inhaler and he ended up passing away. And that is the reason why now an athletic trainer has to be available on site for football conditioning, uh, especially in the summer. So uh, it's not something to just kind of, you know, uh, just slough off, all right? It's a lung disease, which the airway becomes inflamed and restricted, the airflow uh, along with bronchoconstriction. So again, years ago, when I was a kid, kids with asthma didn't, didn't play sports. And now it's, you know, I got a bag that I keep in my trunk for football and, and I have a, a with all everybody's inhalers in it. So if they have a problem during practice, they come over and use it to have a smaller bag for baseball because we don't have as many people, so. Uh, in the fall of 2012, the uh, Doug Kaza, Dr. Doug Kaza, who is at the University of Connecticut, he runs the Corey Stringer Institute, convinced uh, the NATA, the NCAA, NA NCAA, and actually got the US Olympic Committee to develop a, uh, they put together this inter-association task force to cr create a document on preventing sudden death and, and, and uh, uh, strength and conditioning activities. And I, I was, at the time, I was chair of our college university athletic training committee, and so I was able to uh, participate in this. So in addition to our sponsors, we had a, a number of groups, NASM, uh, the AOSSM, AMSSM, which is the team physician group, uh, Canadian athletic therapist, the other strength, uh, strength and conditioning, uh, college strength and conditioning coaches association. So uh, a lot of people were represented. It was pretty interesting to sit there and, and listen to some of the presentations they did on some of these problems. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of overview. This is the consensus statement that everybody involved, all these medical groups, the strength and conditioning groups, everybody agreed upon. And part of the NATA uh, uh, consensus statement uh, package. But, just to not bore you too much, this is the, the kind of like a, an overview of, of what, the recommendations. One, progressive acclimatization. Um, you know, again, that University of Iowa case of bringing everybody in that first day and just beating the crap out of them, that doesn't work. Uh, Tom Leislinski, who is the, the strength and conditioning coach of the Jaguars, Tom played at the University of Tennessee, was a football player, played for the Steelers for a number of years. 
master's degree in exercise science, um, then at North Carolina. And he was at a school, and, and, and his first day, he took him out and he basically ran a testing session. See where every individual athlete was. And he said he came in and his coaches ripped him. What do you know? We should have beat the crap out of him. We had a crappy out of him. Time out, guys. This is, we will, we will work them hard, but I need to find out where they're at. And that, that's the very first step that we need to take. Um, we need a gradual introduction of new conditioning activities. And you can't take them out like they did at the University of Iowa and do 100 squats and, and, and for time. Um, you can't use exercise, I'm, I'm saying you can't. Please don't use exercise and conditioning as a form of punishment. As coaches, you have so many more options, okay? What's the biggest one? Playing time. You know, that athlete that comes in the preseason and they're out of shape, um, I was at Penn State for six years, Joe Paterno sent them home. Go home, come back and get in shape. You know, when, when you're in shape, you come back out. Um, don't play them. Don't even dress them. Make them explain to their parents why they're not dressed. Don't give them their tickets for games. Make them explain to their parents why they had to pay to get in the game. Uh, with football at Princeton, what we've done is we have, the way our stadium is, we have, a, we have two tunnels, a home and visitors tunnel. And the birds have, we're trying to fight it, but they've taken up, nesting up in some of the girders in the tunnels. So there's bird dung all over the place. So you know what, you can't get yourself in shape, come on, go get a broom and a shovel, and they clean up the bird dog. <coughs> make them clean the locker, make them pick up the locker, make them do, some, do something other than conditioning them. Okay, because most of them could do it, they'll fight through the conditioning stuff. But man, you, their, their teammates see them with a, a broom and a shovel, that will, make a, that, will, that will stay with them for a while. Ensure proper education, experience, and credential and strength and conditioning stuff. That was a big thing. The strength coaches, both groups, the one thing that they did agree on was that everybody should be certified um, in, uh, to be able to put together strength and conditioning programs. And I believe the NCAA has just made that a, they never make anything mandatory. Uh, besides, you can't give somebody a bagel with cream cheese. You give them a bagel or cream cheese. But, um, all right, but um, I don't know if anybody knows, for, I know that was part of the package last year that um, everybody was gonna have to be, you, as a coach, you can't put together a strength and conditioning program. It should be somebody that's educated and certified, so. Um, provide for appropriate medical coverage. And I know that's hard. At Princeton, we have 40 sports, we have 11 athletic trainers. I can't be everywhere all the time. I, when, you know, soccer's working out at 6.30 in the morning, I can't be there, because the other soccer team's practicing at seven o'clock at night, you just can't be there all the time. So, uh, but as coaches, and this is obviously self-serving, but help Kim advocate for, for more athletic training help. It, it'll help you in the long run. So. Um, develop and most importantly, practice emergency action plans. Having a really nice emergency action plans, you know, and a nice booklet and the whole thing isn't enough. It doesn't do anything if you haven't practiced and you don't know where, you, where, you, where you're going. Um, Paul's probably, you've been to our facility, right? So down, we have an indoor facility and we have an area where the 35 pound weight throwers and the shot putters can and indoors. And right next to the circle on the wall is a telephone. And we had a case a few years ago uh, where the coach is no longer with us, but one of the officials got hit, the shot bounced and hit him in the shin. And so instead of picking up the phone that was right next to the circle, he ran up the stairs around and up to the training room, came in. <laughs> what? Slow down, Ed. Slow down. And the first thing on my mind was, Ed, did you know there was a phone right next to you? <laughs> All right, so anyway. So knowing where that stuff is, is, is critical. I, I'm, I'm making a joke out of it, but I shouldn't. But it, it's, it's really important. University of Georgia, they put all their coaches on buses. And they go run around to every facility. And they go through the emergency action plan for every facility. <clears throat> We've already mentioned this, but being cognizant of key medical conditions. Communication with Kim and his staff and the doctors. Who has sickle cell? Who has asthma? Does the asthma patient uh, person, do they have their inhaler with them all the time? All those guys. Does anybody have a, a cardiac issue that we need to know about? I have three baseball players with cardiac issues that don't, uh, all, three separate kids, different doctors, and all three, neither of them can lift over 100 pounds when they're in the weight room. It doesn't bother me, it's baseball, we don't need to do that anyway, we can do other things. 
Okay? But I know that, the baseball coaches know that, and the strength and conditioning staff knows that. Okay? Um, we've already talked about the proper staff for, for strength and conditioning. Um, um, I don't know what that one is. Partnership of recognized professional organizations. Don't worry about that one. I don't even know how they get in there. Um, ensure proper education. You know, hopefully your strength coaches are getting, you know, they're, they're increasing their education. Athletic trainers, yourself. Spend all the time you can picking the brains of people doing uh, the strength and conditioning in your sport. Um, are these things legal documents? I don't know. I don't know if Kim, you know, if Kim wants to comment when he went through the process, did this come up? Well, the problem is, is when you're sitting in an attorney's office under a deposition, that's not the world we live in. It's a very intimidating experience if any of you have had the pleasure. Uh, and when they put these documents, are you aware of this? We can sit in the comfort of our own home and go, yeah, this is a guideline, who cares? But I'm going to tell you that when you're sitting in those environments and they put this document in front of you and say, are you aware of this? And you say yes. That comfort level of it just being a guideline does not yeah. exist anymore. It is a legal document because you're going to be held to that standard. Because think about it. I can, I'm trying to defend a fatality based on my interpretation of the word guideline. So that person is going to say, you know the American Medical Association, right? The NSCA, right? The NMPA, right? I mean, he's going to go through 20 minutes of every major organization in the country who has agreed. So my little self-interpretation of the word guideline is, is, is not going to win. So we call it a guideline, but the fact of the matter is, when those heavy hitters have made this document a national, a national guideline, assume it is. Assume it is. Because here's the deal. Spin it around. If we adhere to this, God forbid we have another catastrophic event, we can defend the fact that we adhere to that document when it's thrown in front of us. And that's the way we have to. The, the world's changed. We all know that. The culture's changed. Kids have changed. You know, the Rutgers, Boston University, and there's lots of examples out there that the world's changing. We've got to make sure we're changing with it and protecting ourselves. So, yeah, and none of these things will guarantee, there's no guarantees. You know, sudden cardiac death is. They actually, there was a, a legislator in New Jersey, we had a, a young man, bas high school basketball player, uh, sudden cardiac death during a game. And the legislator actually filed a bill that said, if a coach is aware of um, that somebody is, is uh, suffering sudden cardiac death and they allow them to continue to play, that coach needs to be suspended. <laughs> oh, <wait. laughs> Seriously, sudden cardiac death. The kid's not going to play. Don't worry about it. Okay, but is the coach aware of some signs and symptoms? Yes, they should be aware of that. Um, you know, we talked about communication between the medical staff. So when the doctors see somebody, they got to make sure they tell the athletic training staff. The athletic training staff has to sit down with the coaches and the strength coaches and anybody else that's involved and tell them make sure they understand what the issues are. Um, the weather issues. Heat, cold. You know, the NCAA has a guideline on participation in cold weather. How many people know that? Okay. So you need to know that stuff. Um, lightning. Sorry, excuse me, the, the uh, spelling of lightning, but um, there is a NCAA policy on lightning. Lightning. Does everybody know what that is? Okay. Does everybody? Do we have a system here at the university where we have an event going on? How, how is that event stopped in the case of lightning? Uh, we had a soccer game going on, and the, uh, my staff member was trying to stop the game. We had lightning. The referee, who was in soccer at least, is in charge of the game, refused. And soon after that, a lightning bolt struck one of the dorms that's just above the soccer field. Boom, total blackness. Everybody got off the field, and they went in. Okay, lightning deaths. For the most part, are preventable. Okay, not all the time. Lightning can happen on a day like today. It's a blue sky right now. It can happen. But if there is lightning in the area and you ignore it, that's a preventable death. Okay? Do you know where you have to go in case of lightning? Under a shed? Under a where you gotta go? You gotta be in a building or in a in a car. You can't be under an overhang. Okay? You can't be in an alcove. You need to be inside the building. You should be out of the pool. Okay? 
right? That's that's a guideline out of the pool. The uh, uh, national, what is it? NAO. People from Rhode Island should know this. The oceanographic. Mm -hmm. They recommend out of the pool because the lightning can strike the pipe, and people have been electrocuted in the pool during a lightning storm. Okay, try to tell us uh, where's Mick. Do you, right? If I'm gonna, I, you, you know, tell you, you gotta clear the pool. There's a lightning storm. You probably the first thing you say is, I'm in the building. But it's it's true. It can happen. So um, emergency action plans. We've talked about them. Okay, they are. There's a position statement on them for the NATA. The NCAA has guidelines for them. Um, we've talked about legal standards. Um, very, very important, and you need to know them. One of the things that I, I go over with my coaches is you may be, uh, uh, I'll pick on Mick. Uh, again, he's a swim coach. I'm not picking on him, I'm just, okay? And during, in September, they're going to go out and they're going to use a track for an activity. And if he doesn't know what the emergency action plan is for the outdoor track, and, some, and there's a problem, what's going to happen, okay? So Mick needs to know where, what the pro, what's the procedure out of the track. So don't just think about, well, I'm in the gym, I'm on the volleyball court, or I'm in the basketball court, or I'm in the weight room. I'm, okay, you may be taking them somewhere where you're not used to being, okay? And you may not know where everything, find out where that stuff is. Um, the track, or cross country at least, and, and the track, the distance run is scare me to death. They're going out, 10 mile run. How do we communicate with them that you need to get inside? You know, all of a sudden the lightning, you know, we, get, we, we have a radar, we have a weather system and I can find out when there's weather. Um, but how do I tell these kids that are out, you know, they're five, six miles out? How do we get, you know, we try to, there's at least one of them that has a cell phone. I gotta get to the coach, the coach has to call that kid and you know, hopefully they can get somewhere where they can get inside. Uh, but that's very important. You know, if you know a storm is coming, I hate to tell, I know the track, they hate to miss a day of running, but you may say you need to wait until this thing passes. Uh, the only, okay, we already talked about only beneficial if they're practiced and implemented, updated, all that stuff. Uh, again, that, that, that'll be, that will be a legal document, and they, you will be questioned on what's your emergency action plan for, for the facility. Uh, venue specific documents, we talked about that a little bit, and activity specific. So if you're in the medical center, running around the track is different than being in the gymnastics facility. Okay, so what's the difference, what are the different things that we need to prepare for on the track as opposed to in the gymnastics area? Signage, uh, I just went back. Um, Princeton is the worst place for signs. You can't find your way around anything. Buildings don't have names on them, and we're fighting now to get signage up for, for emergency action plan. Where, where do you go if you have lightning? Where does the baseball team go? Or, or during summer camp, where does the base, where do those kids go to in, in the event of a lightning storm? Okay, so I need to make sure that they, they understand that. Uh, discuss, you know, workout goals and plan. Again, if, you're, if your goal is to is to make somebody tougher, that's, a, that's gonna be a really hard one to defend, okay? There's no scientific basis for it. Um, a few years ago, the NCAA, after this Northwestern case, the NCAA decided to, uh, that the athletic trainer has the unchallengeable authority to stop any workout they deem unsafe. Uh, that, some, some part of that makes me happy, some part of, that, part of that makes me really scared. Because if I don't stop the activity, the coach says, I don't know, Trainer said it was okay. Trainer didn't stop it. Woo, you know. So, you know, and there's a lot of athletic trainers in this country that are living day to day because at any time the coach is going to say, eh, he stopped too many workouts, we're going to get rid of him. Okay, or her. So um, it gives us not only ultimate uh, authority, but it also gives us ultimate responsibility. Um, signs and symptoms of, of distress. Um, you know, you see the athletes, we're running, we're doing a run test or conditioning test. And some of the guys, or kids, or athletes are standing, they get their hands on their hips, whatever. Okay, what's the next step? Then they go to this, right? And we tell them, stand up straight, uh, stand up straight. And then they go to one knee. You know, get off your knee. Then they go to two knees, all fours. And then they're down on the ground. And then they're getting in the ambulance. Okay, so we need to recognize, especially if we know they have a medical problem, signs and symptoms. When we did this task force, there was a, an athlete, I'm, I'm not gonna say the university, was in the Midwest. They actually had pictures of their workout. And 
they had pictures of this at sink it and he's you see him like this he's got his hands on his knees and then there's another picture he's down on one knee and then there's another picture he's down on all fours and there's a coach of some sort i don't know who it was over top of him yelling at him and then the kids on the ground and ended up dying so he had that part of the problem and nobody recognized the signs and symptoms and then they were at a uh, a facility that was uh, i'm not going to say it was off campus but it wasn't close to things right across the street from a hospital so they had no idea what to do with it they ended up throwing him in a landscaping truck in a pile of mulch they drove him over probably three quarters of a mile to the athletic training room where he was and then they called the ambulance and, and he died all they had to do was they could have carried him across the street to the hospital and maybe okay, i can't say for sure but maybe he lived so there's tremendous failure there um let me go back to that because i think it's the bottom one, full disclosure. I am guilty. I have been that person going, this guy is a dog. You you know what? You don't want to practice? You just run. I'm tired of dealing with you, you know, frustration. Just run, blah, blah, do all this stuff. I, I, I've done that in the past, years ago. Luckily, years ago. Luckily, everybody survived. But I tell you, that, that's a scary thought for me after 34 years. Scary, scary thought. So I am guilty. I admit that. I'm not proud of it but it, it can happen. Um, the bottom line is we all have a level of authority and the athletes look to us as authority figures, all of us. Um, we all have a level of responsibility and we all have a level of accountability. In the, in the end, it's on us, it's not on the athlete, it's on us. Um, we are all held accountable for the health and well-being of the student athletes, right? You go and you sit in a, in, a, in, a, in a kid's living room and you tell the parents, we're going to do that forever. We're going to get them educated. We're going to have a great experience here. You, you promise them that. Okay? We've got we to gotta uphold that promise, okay? all of us. So as an athletic trainer, I've got to make sure I'm doing the right thing. And sometimes the right thing is pushing the kid back onto the field. If they're going to play, I know they need to get out there and play. Um, sometimes it's pulling them back saying, no, I, I can't let you play. We had an athlete. First freshman in the history of the league to rush for a thousand yards. In January, we do our exams after Christmas. He's sitting in his room, uh, a 19-year-old kid has a stroke. You can't find out why. He had in high school he had a splenic infarct, so which is somewhat similar stroke, no no cause. This kid who could have been the greatest running back in the history of Princeton, better than uh, Dick Kazmaier, you know all these other guys that played there, and we've had to keep him out of sports. I had to do that that's what was best for him. He hates me. He won't talk to me. He goes out to practice he, to watch. Walks right past me and then won't talk to our doctors either. Hates us. Someday, I hope he wakes up and goes, wow, I'm glad. Um, failure to meet the individual standards for any of these three entities makes, us, makes a crisis a real possibility. Okay, we've been through it here. Um, so don't be the next one. Don't be that person to have regrets. Um, you know, don't be the next news story. You know, what's, what is it worth? It's, it's a sport, it's a game, okay? And I know there's pressure for a lot of you winning and losing, okay? But none of that is, is, is bigger than this, all right? Um, for the most part, these are preventable deaths. Not all of them, but for the most part, they are all preventable, so. Thank you, and I uh, appreciate the time.